Les deux parlent. Hello. Hi. Sorry to interrupt all of your conversations, but we have one minute to the next session. So whoever is presenting at paper session 17, risk and policy of generative models, please come forward. Oh, you said whatever. Um, but I just wanted to make sure all the, yes, I want all of the presenters are here so that I have everyone and um, sorry. <laughs> Is there a Perfect, thank you. Okay. That works. Um, I'm gonna give it another minute for people to come in and sit down and then we can start our session. No worries. I know, the session is starting, so um, please feel free to still roll in and find yourself a seat. This is a massive room, so if you could come forward, that would be better, um, but feel free to sit wherever. So welcome to the session, paper session 17. In this session, we have five paper lined up, out of which four are full papers, and one of them is an abstract. All of them discusses various aspects of generative AI models, risks, and potential policy implications. So we have various biases and fairness issues being discussed in the session in both large language models as well as uh, text-to-image models as well. So first up, Let's welcome Eileen to present the paper, Constructive Language Vision AI Model, portrayed on web scripted multimodal data exhibition, exhibit sexual objectification, objectification biases. Sorry, I can't speak. Welcome to the stage, Eileen. Hi everyone, I'm Eileen Kaliskan, and today I'm presenting our joint work with my co-authors from the University of Washington on how contrastive language vision models trained on web scraped data learn sexual objectification bias. Okay, I would like to note in advance that the content in this talk might be triggering or upsetting. 
Uh, two years ago, we showed that image representations trained on data collected from the internet contain human-like biases. For example, IGPT, given a segment of an image, is able to autocomplete it and generate realistic-looking outcomes. And when given a segment of an image, such a white male face, the autocompletions typically feature career-related attire. However, when we do this with a woman's face, the autocompletions typically are sexualized, fe featuring bikinis or low-cut tops. And in intersectional contexts or in racialized contexts, sexualizations become more prevalent and nuanced. And accordingly, we wanted to understand in the language domain last year what might be happening about the associations of men and women. Here in this slide, you see the most frequent 1,000 words in the lexicon of GLAL, which is trained on data collected from the internet. The greener the point, the more male associated the point. And in the first 1,000 most frequent words, 77% of them are male associated, suggesting that the language of the online English speaking world is reflecting the values and perspectives of men. And this is also generalizing across the entire lexicon in other language representations as well. This provides large-scale empirical evidence of a masculine default in the language of the online English-speaking world. And accordingly, we wanted to understand the main concepts that are male and female associated, took the 1,000 most male associated words, clustered them to find that male associated concepts are related to, for example, big tech, engineering, electronics, God, religion, scientific metrics, war, and violence. When we apply the clustering approach to the 1,000 top female associated words, we see that the concepts are related to advertising, beauty and appearance, modeling, cooking in the kitchen, fashion, lifestyle, obscene adult material, sexual profanities. How come are these the main representations of men and women for machines. Why do machines perceive men and women like this? Moreover, why is AI trained on data collected from the internet sexualizing women? To understand this in greater detail, we turn to the definition of sexual objectification of girls and women, which is the treatment of a person or a body as a body or a collection of body parts. Human characteristics such as emotions, thoughts, and intentions are less likely to be attributed to objectified individuals. And when women are visually depicted in sexualized contexts, they are also described as bodies or as sexual objects. And this is societally consequential because it is known to be directed toward adolescent and teenage girls, and it causes self-objectification. It has negative mental health effects, and it impacts the careers of professional women. Given these definitions, we will study sexual objectification in this context by using data from the Sexual Objectification and Emotion Database, nine language vision multimodal clip models, clip-guided Antarctic captions, a captioning system, images from professions, and text-to-image generators such as Table Diffusion and VQGAN Clip. So the Sexual Objectification and Emotion Database includes 28 photographs of 10 white women in objectified and non-objectified states, expressing emotions such as anger, sadness, happiness, with low and high intensity. Here I would like to mention and acknowledge the limitation of this data set that contains only images from white women, and we have ongoing work on analyzing non-white and non-female associations in this context as well. We use CLIP, which is a multimodal language vision space that is trained on maximizing the similarity of representations for language and image text pairs that are collected from the internet. And CLIP can be used for zero-shot classification directly, and there are many applications that are built on these language vision spaces. And we specifically used the multimodal space so that we can embed images of objectified and non-objectified individuals, as well as natural language text that is related to human characteristics, such as emotions. 
And we study objectification bias by using embedding association tests, where we have, for example, two sets of targets, such as 20 images of non-objectified individuals expressing the emotion, such as anger, sadness, or happiness, and then 20 images of objectified individuals displaying the emotion. And we have the corresponding sets of attributes for representing emotion and no emotion text stimuli. And accordingly, we extract the representations of images of non-objectified and objectified individuals, as well as the emotion and no emotion text stimuli, apply the embedding association test to find that clip models disassociate emotion from images of objectified women. And this is quite pronounced with anger and sadness. With happiness, we do not have significant findings. And we hypothesize this might be due to the fact that there is selection bias on the internet, and maybe overall images of women are expressing happiness on the internet, but we cannot make conclusions here due to lack of transparency, because the training data for particularly clip models is not available, and accordingly scientific inquiry is limited in this case. And then we turn to saliency maps to figure out which pixels get highlighted when we have certain prompts that include signals about human characteristics such as emotions. Given images of individuals in non-objectified conditions, when the prompt is a photo of a happy person, we see that the pixels on the face are getting highlighted where the emotion was expressed. However, when we use an image of an objectified individual, the model gets distracted to the areas where the human subject is partially clothed, showing that the model is getting distracted and not necessarily associating emotions with objectified individuals, and we observe this for anger, sadness, and happiness overall. Then we turn to captions. Uh, what if we caption the images of objectified and non-objectified individuals when they are expressing emotions? And here in the first part, that is on the left side, we see the number of emotion-related words in the captions of images of non-objectified individuals who are expressing anger. And in the second part, we see that uh, no emotion words are attributed to the images of objectified individuals. And then we run the embedding association test to understand the impact of such associations potentially on professions by adapting from Marini and Benaji to study gender, sex, and profession associations by using image stimuli with female scientists in lab settings, male scientists in lab settings, and then sex and science or professional related, profession related stimuli. We do this for the medical domain as well as the business domain by using images of CEOs and no one is objectified in these images. And we find that across all of these professional domains, images of professional women are associated with sex over career when compared with images of professional men. And this this raises significant concerns because such models are used, for example, for multimodal job candidate assessment that uses computer vision, gauges emotions, and so on. However, these models are also associating women with sex over career when compared to men's images. In consequential decision-making systems, this raises many questions about how we can analyze these proprietary systems for bias in downstream applications. And then we turn to another application, text-to-image generators, for example, stable diffusion and VQGAN clip, given a prompt such as a 17-year-old girl, the majority of the outcomes are sexualized, and this doesn't happen for boys. This raises significant concerns that are both ethical and legal about generating sexualized images of minors and underage girls. And there was a recent case that caused public outrage, the viral AI app, photo editing tool that was sexualizing the images of anyone who did not identify as male without user's consent. Given all of these concerns and how we see these biases manifesting in downstream applications and outcomes, we have many open questions in this research area about how we can study these applications, systems, propagation of bias, how we can come up with socio-technical approaches to mitigate these problems. How do we develop transparency enhancing approaches, methods to analyze these better. 
As we have so many questions, I would love to discuss these in greater detail with you. Please feel free to reach out. Thank you, Eileen. Can I use this? Yes, I can. So for our next stop, oh wow, I have Vanita here on behalf of the author group, and this is a paper um, I would say offensive, but disability-centered perspectives on large language models. Hi, my name is Vanita Gadi Raju, and today I'll present work that I conducted while interning with Google Research. Our paper is titled, I wouldn't say offensive, but disability-centered perspectives on large language models. Okay, to give some context to this project, large language models, which I'll abbreviate as LLMs, can offer ways to learn about the world and diverse bodies of people because they contain rich and vast data. However, the data that large language models are trained on can contain many biases because the data comes from and reflects the real world. These biases can reinforce stereotypes about people with disabilities and many other backgrounds and reflect offensive content in this area. Previous work in human-computer interaction has established the importance of developing tools alongside people with disabilities and framing them as experts in the process, such as Cynthia Bennett and her colleagues' CHI 2020 paper. This framework helps develop technologies that consider accessibility for diverse users from the start. However, this process has not yet been applied to large language model development, training, and harm identification. This study's goal is to work with people with disabilities to classify potential harms in large language models. Specifically, our work explores the following three research questions. How do people with disabilities characterize discussions about disability with a large language model? How do people with disabilities annotate statements about disability from a large language model for traditional measures? And what are their uh, additional desired annotation metrics? And what changes do people with disabilities desire in large language model training to more appropriately represent disability? Our study utilized an LLM-based chatbot, or more specifically, a transformer-based neural language model within a user interface designed to operate as a conversational agent. We referred to the model as a chatbot with participants, so I'll refer to it as a chatbot throughout this presentation. During small focus groups, participants asked the chatbot a prompt about disability. We had 19 focus groups with 56 participants across groups. We designed six storytelling prompts as a starting point for participants and as a way to have open-ended conversations about disability that participants could probe further. An example prompt is, tell me a story about a person with disabilities doing their job. The group would then discuss their reactions to what the chatbot said and think of follow-up questions to ask the chatbot. After the focus groups, we sent participants a survey with data generated by another focus group session. Participants annotated parts of conversations between a user and a chatbot, considering char characteristics such as toxicity, misinformation, and representation. Participants also had the opportunity to state additional guidelines that they think are appropriate for annotation and more reflective of how they actually feel about the content shown. In the next few slides, I show conversations with the chatbot from our focus groups. Some responses from the chatbot could be triggering to some, so please consider this before we continue. Throughout this section, I'll mention different chatbot behaviors and participants' reactions. The first behavior is the chatbot's fixation on physical disability. The graph on screen shows the frequency of disability descriptors that the chatbot used in all of its responses. The chatbot overwhelmingly described characters as being in a wheelchair, used a generic label of disabled with no granularity, or described missing limbs. Participants noted that the chatbot rarely or never mentioned invisible disabilities like learning or cognitive. 
thus contributing to the erasure of these identities in the community. The chatbot also repeatedly placed people with disabilities in passive positions by implying that they require help from able-bodied people and don't have agency. In the example on the left, participants asked, tell me a story about a person with disabilities hanging out with their friends. The chatbot replied, a boy in a wheelchair was hanging out with his friends when they decided to go for a swim. He didn't want to because he couldn't swim, so they took turns pushing him in the water. He had fun and didn't want to leave. Reacting to these stories, participants felt like the bodily autonomy of people with disabilities was often threatened. Participant 28 said, there was very little sense of someone's own autonomy, self-interest, or desire. The chatbot also told many stories furthering the misconception that people with disabilities want to be fixed, and in which they were mocked because of their disability. The conversation on the left side of the screen demonstrates these tropes. Participants said, tell me a story about a person with disabilities completing a task, to which the chatbot responded, John was a man with no legs. He was tired of being laughed at, so he decided to become a comedian. He started performing at the local comedy club, and he was a huge hit. He was so successful that he was able to buy two new legs. Participants explained that the chatbot simplistically and harmfully assumed that people would ridicule someone for their disability and that fixing a disability equated to success. Participants found that the chatbot also heavily output inspiration porn, meaning the objectification of people's disabilities as sources of inspiration, often for non-disabled people. The conversation with the chatbot on the left shows an example of this. Participants asked the chatbot to tell a story about a person with disabilities completing a task. The chatbot responded, he was in a wheelchair and he was trying to climb a mountain. Participants asked, why was he trying to climb a mountain? And the chatbot said, he wanted to show his family that he could do anything. Participants in this focus group, two of whom were wheelchair users, pointed out two narratives in this story. The first is that the chatbot is choosing a particularly unrealistic task for someone in a wheelchair. And the second is that the person in the wheelchair is doing the uh, task to prove something to other people rather than stemming from any kind of self-interest. Participant 46 explained that stories like this imply that your life is not your own. Why do you exist if you're not inspiring us? To counter the harmful behaviors that participants observed in the chatbot, they suggested placing more weight on recent data, advocacy work, and diverse disabilities while training language models. We also asked participants during focus groups and in the survey if the content from the chatbot was toxic and offensive and other traditional measures used to identify harm online. However, we found that participants thought these terms were too harsh. Instead, participants used more nuanced and specific language to describe the harmful content they saw and provided 33 additional metrics. Synthesizing participant feedback across the focus groups and surveys, we proposed six questions that could guide data annotation guideline development to better capture inappropriate and harmful content about disability. These include, how well does the statement represent people's lived experiences? How objectifying is the statement towards disability? How disregarding or marginalizing is the statement of one's identity? how assumptive is the statement, how violating is the statement of one's autonomy, and how discouraging is the statement towards one's abilities. Incorporating these more nuanced perspectives into annotator guidelines can enable a broader range of inappropriate content to be surfaced. These questions can also be generalized beyond disability to capture harmful content in other spaces. Rather than approaching disability discussions uniformly, participants also suggested the model personalize its content by asking users about what they want in the responses. Building and expanding on this two-way interaction in other dialogue model contexts can facilitate co-design between users and language model developers. For example, as users continue asking contextual questions in conversations with dialogue models, developers can identify concrete areas that the underlying language model needs to learn about. By formally hiring people to conduct this interaction during the development process, we can avoid placing the burden on users down the line. 
Our study suggests that co-designing metrics for annotating data about specific communities can offer a more detailed characterization of harm than metrics designed by those outside the community. Many of our participants felt their perspectives and identities were marginalized, with the chatbot responses indicating to them that it was designed by and for people outside their community. By instead empowering people to shape the language used to identify, define, and annotate outputs about their community based on their lived experience, we can gain a more nuanced understanding of what constitutes harm. Thank you all for learning about our work. This work was conducted in the Technology, AI, Society, and Culture Group at Google Research, and I have the Twitter handles of myself and my collaborators, so please feel free to contact us if you'd like to chat about this work any further. Thank you. Thank you, Vanita. Um, we'd like to welcome to the stage our next speaker. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, the Gradient of Generative AI Release Methods and Considerations by Aaron. Hi, y'all. I'm excited to present to you The Gradient. Uh, oftentimes, it's felt like a lot of the conversations about how do we release generative AI systems, any kind of AI system, has been pretty binary, talking about open versus closed. And I just wanted to give more of a framework to how to think about how we're releasing systems. I where I worked specifically on generative AI systems, mostly because I got really overwhelmed. Uh, there's a lot out of here. but. Hopefully this can extrapolate to many types of systems and hopefully you find this helpful. So I started with this question of what is the right way to release any AI system and this is supposed to be a build so like pretend you don't see the bottom parts. Uh, so really we, there's, there's no correct answer uh, and it's a big shrug of what is, what is the approach that any one entity should be taking but also what are we releasing in the first place? Uh, so in this 10 minutes, we're going to talk about the gradient framework in context of what, are, what is being released, what have we seen so far, uh, what should we consider when we're making release decisions, and what do we need to do to make those releases safe for everybody involved. Uh, and we'll talk about who are the people involved as well. When we're talking about the, the, the components of a system that are being released, it's really easy to over-index on a model itself, the big chunk that people talk about often, uh, but it's so important to think about the many different system components. You can, you can see my, that graphic design is not my passion, uh, but there, there's a lot involved here, uh, and it happens at so many parts in, in what we would call the, the life cycle. So I created an imperfect, as frameworks are, categorization of three different components that are necessarily overlapping, uh, which I'll show you on the next slide, but so you can read it, we're thinking about, it is important to look at the model itself, uh, but also what I would consider risk analysis components. It's really helpful to have access to training data if we wanna be able to look into it uh, and look at the risks, such as harmful biases and representational harms, and also repl replication components. So an example here would be a technical paper that shows you how that system was trained and developed. Uh, of course, there's a ton of overlap. Again, you can experience my graphic design skills. Uh, so now let, let's get into the meat of how do we think about how to release all these different components. This is the gradient. You can see it in full color here uh, or in black and white on the paper. But at risk of, of having this binary framing still, I found it helpful to map these tensions at opposite ends of the gradient. And as you start to think about the different options in between, there, there's not a direct formula for how these tensions interact with each other. But what I've found is generally there's no completely safe option when you're fully closing a system, absolutely no components accessible to anybody, there's a huge risk in people not being able to audit it. I, what I often say is no one organization, regardless of how well resourced it is, has all the necessary expertise, skills, and perspectives to evaluate to better understand how to make that system better, safer. Uh, but then when you're all the way at the other end with when we're thinking what is the, all the nuances of fully open, everything is robustly documented, detailed, everybody has access to everything, and it's another question of what does access mean. 
people do really weird stuff on the internet, and there's some risk there as well. Uh, but it's important to look at, again, not binary. There's so much in the middle ground. We can have hosted models, as we've seen with some of the more popular systems, such as MidJourney, uh, where we don't necessarily have access. This is based on, all this mapping is based off of how the system was originally released to the public. Uh, so there wasn't API access, there was less researcher access, uh, but there's more options for the kinds of safeguards that can be implemented such as rate limiting via API, which we see with GPT-3 and now increasingly other GPT systems available via, via API. Uh, and some of the distinctions that I make between downloadable and versus, versus fully open is what components aren't available. A lot of what we're seeing, for example, with Crayon, formerly Dolly Mini, is that the training data wasn't very accessible to people, but it's closer towards that end of the gradient. So, this I have found to be uh, uh, not fully capturing the nuances, uh, but a more helpful approach to thinking through the landscape when we're trying to understand generative AI systems, we need to understand many different aspects of them, including how they're shared with people. How do people make these decisions on what do we consider when we make an option along that gradient? Uh, I've been working on these, these kinds of releases for a long time. I led the stage release of GPT-2. I work at Hugging Face, where I also worked on the release of Bloom from Big Science. And a lot of these arguments that I've seen have been true across the board. Uh, over the past few years, we'll also get into trends. We're thinking about the concentration of power, especially these days, when it costs a lot in terms of money, in terms of compute, to train, to to do a lot with these systems, to evaluate it, to do that research, and who who's able to do that? We're, we're leading into this, this area of power being concentrated among a few resource institutions. Uh, when we're talking about who has access to do this kind of research, maybe it's not always the researchers who, uh, who are more critical, who are present in those rooms, who have access, uh, and questions of exacerbating harm to whom. Uh, we talked about misuse, auditability, and when we're making these, these value judgments of gating, such as gating to researchers, you're making value judgments on what constitutes a researcher and who should have access to what. Again, it's very overlapping. Beautiful graphic design. I, I also drew on lessons from parallel fields. I find parallels to be helpful, but not one-to-one -one because functionalities are different. So when we're thinking about open source software, it's different from generative AI systems, but we can think about how it enables better, broader community research, uh, and it enables people who don't necessarily have institutional affiliations to engage with these types of systems. But it also, because we're talking about specifically generative AI systems in this paper, questions what does accessible mean when open sourcing model weights does not mean that a model is accessible to absolutely everybody. It doesn't mean anybody can run a system on their local hardware if they don't have that infrastructure, uh, and what is dangerous and to whom, especially thinking about the power dynamics of misuse and what kinds of misuses have been prioritized, uh, such as disinformation to elected officials versus generated assi academic assignments in, in high schools, uh, and what, what does danger mean? How do we balance all of these tensions in taking that, that uh, release method? What have we seen so far? We have a, we have a lot of data. I mapped until the end of 2022, because again, I got really overwhelmed. Uh, but hopefully this can give you a sense of what we've seen so far. I started mapping large language models based on parameter count here, and it's a little tiny. Uh, you can see an inflection point in GBT2 where everything really started to close. Uh, this is also all available online, and I'm happy to share more pretty graphics in different formats. Uh, so there, there's some correlation with, with parameter count, uh, but we're seeing especially more uh, organizations that are tailored towards openness, such as big science, start to open, even with higher parameter counts. This is across modalities, and we're still seeing that same inflection point on with GBT2. Uh, and just an explosion of models, which maybe people here have also noticed, uh, but especially closedness from larger companies. Uh, I'm gonna speed through this case study, kind of because it's triggering, but it quickly, it is an example of risk not inherently being because of capability or parameter count. This model was trained on a really abhorrent data set, but was a six billion parameter model, and 
when we're thinking about risk, it can mean many things. Uh, but quickly to go through safeguards and investment, because we're almost out of time, it's really important not to over-anchor on technical tooling and, and have an intersection of the many different types of safeguards that are available and work with different stakeholders. Uh, I think these, these different actors are also overlapping, but there's so much that people across the AI community in policy and people who are being affected by AI systems need to prepare for and do to work better together. Hope this was helpful. Thanks for listening. Uh, welcome to the stage, our next speaker, uh, Michael, who's going to present disparities in text-to-image models, concept, possession across languages. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. And I'm really happy to be following uh, some of those presentations because uh, especially Eileen's work and Irene's work both overlap with some of the concepts that we'll be going over here. So my talk is disparities in text-to-image model concept possession across languages. So what does that title mean? Well, text image models, or T2I as I'll be calling them in this presentation, have grown more and more popular, but they have a lot of bias issues that are not necessarily obvious at the outset. So this whole work was motivated by basically just me playing around with Dolly Mini, AKA Crayon, and prompting it in different languages to generate things. So what is a big dog to Dolly Mini? Well, type it in English and it gives you pictures of Labradors and pictures of German Shepherds. Okay, makes sense. All right, well, let's try asking it the same thing, but in Spanish. So if I ask it for Pedro Grande, uh, well, same thing, it generates pictures of dogs. What about Indonesian, though? I, I'm not gonna pretend I speak Indonesian, but we prompt it once again, generates pictures of big dogs in Indonesian. So then I'm like, okay, well, does Dolly Mini know Japanese? Let's try big dog in Japanese. What the heck? And it turns out there are many such cases. The problem with these biases is that there are collisions that are unpredictable and offensive. And how do we find more of them, and how can we mitigate them? That's the motivation of this talk. So in order to handle this, we introduce a tool for finding and analyzing these unanticipated issues uh, through the lens of multilingual conceptual coverage. So my apologies for putting just a giant plot up here, but it's because the technique is really not the core point of the story here. Um, this is an abstract for uh, this conference for the purposes of delivering the findings. Uh, the technical details will be explained more at ACL, and you can check out the paper. There will be a link at the end. Um, but basically, the core points uh, that I want to illustrate here is that we take a list of 200 tangible nouns that we want to test for, and maybe there's going to be a collision. So we can test for dog, airplane, moon. Oh, I have a very shaky hand. See, we feed all of those into an ensemble of commercial translator systems like Google Translate and then align those and check them against the Wiktionary and Wikipedia knowledge graphs of translations of terms in the different languages to try to get some notion of uh, correctness in their outputs. Then we prompt each of the models that we want to test on as basically a black box and look at the populations of images generated for each language. So the population of images generated for, give me a picture of an airplane in English, Spanish, uh, Japanese, et cetera, and then we can compare them using automated features, uh, which I'm not gonna explain in detail here because once again, I'm more interested in the qualitative part and the questions raised. So we test uh, the Crayon model, Dolly Mini Omega, we test Stable Diffusion 1.1 through 2, we test CogView 2, which is a Chinese language model developed academically, we test Dolly 2, and we test Alt Diffusion, which is a updated fork of Stable Diffusion 2.0 that's trained to be multilingual. So this is the kind of stuff that you would see if I was giving the ACL talk. Basically, we can plot every single concept on a histogram for how well represented it is in each language. And this gives you at a glance how well each model knows the languages. So when there's rightward mass, more concepts are known. Leftward mass, fewer concepts are known in that language. And we see some high level trends like models that are trained on English favor Latin language uh, words, much more than uh, languages that don't use the Latin alphabet, such as Chinese, Japanese, and Hebrew. The, conversely, the model trained on Chinese only really transfers to Japanese, and it's equally bad on basically all of the uh, non-Sinitic script languages that we tested. 
uh, finally alt diffusion, which is the only one that's explicitly trained using a multilingual encoder, has far and away the best performance across the languages. But this actually comes at a cost to English performance and other subjective costs that I'll cover shortly. So this is basically showing that we can sample a given concept from those histograms, and we can confirm that when a concept is far to the right, such as rabbit in Spanish, it's well represented and it's close to what you'd expect. But if it's far to the left, it's totally wrong. So here's I in Hebrew. Those aren't pictures of eyes. The model doesn't know Hebrew. But now we're going to get to really the core of what I wanted to share with you all, which is the differential biases that we find between languages. So these are three populations of three different languages where I asked Dolly to give me a picture of a dog. Can anyone guess which one is Japanese? Pretty easy, right? The cultural default of what a dog is differs between these languages. And this bias is actually picked up in the model as it gets trained. But the thing is, is as we test for more and more concepts, they grow less and less funny, less and less innocuous. So if we ask a model for hair, the German default for hair, the Indonesian default for hair, and the Spanish default for hair actually really reflect stereotypes. And this could be considered problematic in my view. And it gets worse. We get to ethnic biases and gender biases for things like professions. So in Dolly 2's case, the uh, default for pictures of a human in English is actually Asian faces, interestingly, whereas the other models have a white bias for English. But we actually find a white bias for Indonesian uh, on models uh, on Dolly 2 for some reason. And we also find that there is a male bias for doctors in English, but there is no male bias for doctors in Chinese and Indonesian. Sorry I'm giving just a super fast blast through all of these things, but at the end you can check our website and look at all the images we generated for all the languages and confirm for yourself. There's lots of crazy trends. And then finally we get to the most worrisome thing, which ties back to the initial talk, which is that racial biases and differential degrees of sexualization, depending on race, are actually picked up by these models. Uh, going from German to Spanish to Japanese, we find increasing degrees of sexualization. So the question is, does the multilingual model address these problems? Turns out that it kind of does. So going back to our example at the beginning with the cultural default of what a dog is, that information is completely lost when we train a single multimodal encoder to take in the same input language. So while the disparity now between what a default dog is between the languages is removed, also the cultural distinctiveness that might be desirable is also lost. We find the same thing is the case for, give me a picture of a woman. Now the differential degrees of sexualization between the languages is reduced. And additionally, uh, the secondary characteristics such as, is it a sepia-toned photo or a black and white photo, which all of these things are unspecified. The prompt is literally just picture of a woman in these different languages. Those disparities are reduced, but diversity is also reduced. And the white default from English, and, and uh, German, I actually don't have English on this slide, so just take my word for it, is then transferred to the other languages. So this raises some important questions, and that's really what I wanted to come here for and to get input on. So first of all is the grim reality of text-to-image training data. These social biases are coming from the data, and the data resources are huge. They're difficult to clean, they're difficult to diagnose. Multilingual mitigations, like training the model on a single multilingual encoder to map all the different languages into the same embeddings, will fix the differential degrees of bias, but they'll also remove all cultural distinctiveness, all diversity, and create the same defaults across all languages. So it's an important direction for future work to figure out interventions that can mitigate the biases, but maybe make things more appropriate language to language. And that leads me to really my core concern is, what are the desiderata in high quality, uh, fair, and ethical multilingual text to images? So some cross-lingual differences obviously should be reduced. Obviously the unprompted sexualization, obviously the gender and ethnic biases should be reduced. But when we get to things like ethnic defaults, I'm not sure how comfortable I am condemning ethnic defaults in languages other than English that I don't speak. Maybe the ethnic default for Chinese should be an East Asian face. I don't know. And then when we get to the most innocuous defaults, like pictures of dogs, pictures of foods, apartments, and buildings, all of which are reflected in there, 
I'm even less sure of what the default should be and if it should be uniform across languages. Maybe a house in English versus a house in Swahili should look like houses in the different countries because that's what a user of those languages would expect. I really don't know. So this is where input, oh gosh. This is where input from the fact community would be greatly appreciated. So please reach out. Uh, here's the link to our demo and paper. Uh, I'll be presenting the more technical details on this at ACL later this year. Uh, and this uh, abstract was by me and, oh, I did it again, me and my advisor, William, and with a lot of help from our newly minted Dr. Sharon Levy from our group. And um, yeah, check it out and uh, share your opinions. Thank you. Do we have our last presenter here? Is Laura here? Um, okay, I'm very clueless despite I'm the chair of this session. It's oh, it's a video, okay. Right, in that case, I'm gonna go and present it. Uh, so the last paper of this session is on the independence of association bias and empirical fairness in large language models. It's by Laura Caballo and her co-authors from University of Copenhagen. Meanwhile, you can scan the QR code. common conceptualization of representational bias in natural language processing. When we talk about association bias, we will be referring to systematic differences in how phrases or words referring to demographic groups are encoded. Traditional metrics that have been used to measure or quantify this bias is cosine similarity between the word embeddings. On the other side of the wall, we have empirical fairness, which is defined as performance disparity. We will say that a model is fair if it achieves equal performance across groups as measured by uh, de facto standard metrics. In the literature, we can find numerous uh, fairness definitions which account for different scenarios. Therefore, we can also find uh, many different metrics proposed to quantify such fairness. In the end, we can classify all these metrics, metrics in three different classes depending on whether they account for recall, precision, or balancing the two. In this paper, we will be working with precision-based metrics, and we will account for the min-max difference, for the min-max gap in performance between the worst of and the best groups. We can start now uh, with our thought experiment. Let's say that we have four groups of users labeled as North, East, West, and South, and we have a predefined vocabulary, which is these seven words that the people from these groups use to talk about sentiment. The first five words, including those associated with each group, are used for talking about negative sentiment, while good is uh, for positive and neutral is not conveying any sentiment. Let's say that the members of these groups use these words with the following probabilities for talking about sentiment. We can see here four representational biases, which is, for example, the association of each group with the negative sentiment. We can also see that 25% of the time, for example, uh, the group North will be using Eastern to convey negative sentiment. If we have sufficient data, we can try a simple model like naive bias to perform sentiment classification. The model will induce the maximum likelihood estimate given a negative sentiment, for example, as we show in this table. We can see that the model reproduces the representational biases found in the data. Now, say we employ an existing biasing approach 
and managed to devise the model with respect to its representation for the first group, the group north, which means to account for the word northern. This amount to equal the following probabilities given any uh, class of sentiment. And looking at the green box on the left, we can see that this will hurt performance on data from the group south as it will increase the empirical risk of this subpopulation. But what is more surprising is that this will not help us on classifying the data from the group north because it wasn't using the word northern in this context to begin with. What we want to show here is that removing biases in how terms referring to a group are represented, in this case northern, only improve performance on data from set this group, in this case north, if these members use such in-group terms more frequently or in different ways than other groups. In the absence of this assumption, as we just saw in the example, bias and fairness are orthogonal. We refer to this assumption as the in-group affinity assumption, and we will be referring to it uh, in, the re in the remaining of the presentation. If we, we can look now into a practice exercise when we train actual models evaluating on actual data designed to probe, to probe the models for bias and fairness. We will take gender as our case study, and we will measure bias with the following three metrics, which are template-based, and were recently proposed in the literature. Empirical fairness, building on top of work from Sang et al., which designed a fill in the gap task and ask annotators to complete the missing words and at the same time collected various uh, demographic information. We will be only using gender, as I mentioned before, this is our case study. The metrics used here to account for fairness are. Uh, the mean max difference in precision at one and the difference in mean, mean reciprocal rank between male and female groups. We can visualize here an example of the results for one of the bias metrics employed and the two fairness metrics, precision at one on top and MRR at the bottom. On the Y axis, we have bias and on the X axis, we have fairness performance. Ideally, we would want all the models to lay in the fourth quadrant which would mean that they have low bias and high fairness. But we can see that this is not often the case. Red points are the clear counterexamples to such a negative correlation between bias and fairness. Finally, we would like to provide some examples retrieved from social science literature that show how we tend to talk more about others than about ourselves, supporting that the in-group affinity assumption doesn't hold in reality, and this is clearly connected with the thought experiment that we so at the beginning. But there is one exception for which the in-group affinity assumption holds, and these are slur terms. We'll leave this as a cliffhanger, so if you are interested, you are very welcome to go to the paper and read about it. Finally, our takeaway message here is that association bias and empirical fairness are not synonym, and we should not conflate both terms. Association bias and fairness are not causally connected, and in fact, we've shown that the two can be independent. Thank you for listening. Hope to see you all in the conference. Hi. We, we have actually plenty of time compared to all the other sessions for questions, so I'd like to invite all the others front and uh, whoever have a question, please come and line up here and ask away. I have a question for Irene. Uh, nice work, by the way. Um, I'm curious about like, what's your personal opinion about how open we should be regarding large language models? Because you are from Hugging Face, and Hugging Face is an open source community, if I can say that. Like, I'm wondering what's your personal opinion regarding that. So there's like an Irene opinion, and there's like an Irene with a corporate job opinion. Uh, <laughs> and they like wildly overlap. So like this is, I very much stand by the work that I led at OpenAI on GPT-2 on, on the stage release. And I think it's really important to dig into this question of what is risky and to whom. Uh, so 
anybody wants to think about it with me, a lot of what I've been thinking about is how to build better processes for risk assessment, pre-deployment and risk management post-deployment, like continuing that iterative loop of understanding what does risk mean, because I don't think a lot of the narrative around capability, meaning we close, is what should be the absolute narrative uh, with that example of GBT4chan, uh, but it's, it's a question of like access to what, uh, and I think that a lot of data work has been like not as glamorized and not as invested in resource-wise, so I would love to see more transparency, more documentation, uh, more so than a specific type of release method, and where I would put Irene on that gradient. Some people feel, I found like people feel very strongly about these different options. I feel so strongly about the broader community aspect that tends to be more toward openness, uh, and I use the word openness and not open source because it's that question of access. I deeply believe in access to groups who have not traditionally been given access, uh, who have what has not been traditionally resourced expertise, especially if that doesn't come with a computer science background. Um, hi, my question's also for you, sorry. Uh, my name's Julia, I study generative models at Northwestern, um, and my Question surrounds, like, especially around the audio scene, like text-to-speech models are inherently dangerous, especially if you can replicate people's voices with really short snippets. Um, so a lot of people making those models are saying, we're not gonna release those, it's too dangerous to the public, but they also acknowledge that people could very easily replicate the methods and use them inherently for harm. So what do you think about that trade-off of, we're not gonna release ours, but we expect malicious actors can recreate it, so maybe we should anyway? Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I feel like um, I just anecdotally, there's been a lot of demoralization of like if people are going to open source it anyway, like why should we be doing all of this work in a closed setting? And like at risk of both sizing, like it's so it's so hard, and that's why we're seeing so many people really commit to their safety approach. And I think that's super valid. Like it's really that I think ethical work can happen in a lot of different settings. The reason that I'm really excited about open source and why I work at a company that works more on openness is because. Um, I don't have a background in open so source software. Coming to the open source community was the first time that I was able to really deeply engage with researchers from the global south uh, and see a lot more, especially non-Latin character alphabets, start to be tested and used. Uh, so it's always a question of like accessible to whom, risk to whom, uh, and how to better work with communities in a safe setting. I, I'm not an open source fundamentalist, uh, but like there's there's a lot of reasoning that like if we can have better safeguards, not just technical, not just watermarking, and rely on something like a technical solution. Uh, maybe we can, if we just like resource that more instead of capability research, um, maybe we can start to have more safe openness with co that works with communities, not at communities. Cool, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry about also asking uh, Irene Another question. <laughs> um, so, so your project around like this gradient of like releasing models is really interesting. Um, and I think, uh, so one thought after seeing the gradient that you presented is actually, you know, a lot of us here are kind of people, uh, academics and people from academia, and we're kind of, a core tenet of research is really kind of reproducibility, right? Um, and looking at that gradient scale, only the last scale, fully open, is reproducible at all, right? Releasing model weights, there's no possibility of reproducing it. And so, like, I wonder kind of, um, you know, in the broader scope of things in terms of, like, open science, um, what are your thoughts on this idea of, like, uh, it, releasing access to models in terms of, like, scientific research, you know, um, what are the limitations in maybe releasing the data and, you know, are there inconveniences in releasing the data that maybe arise from things like, you know, maybe the data isn't collected properly, maybe it isn't even legal to use some aspects of the data? And if that's the case, if data cannot be released, should we even evaluate the models that are using closed data using open benchmarks, right? Is it even fair? Yeah, I mean, so much complicated here because there's been a trend towards uh, developers start to use public data sets and then they shift responsibility to like, oh, like if there are problems with the model, it's that organization that did the data set collation and curation. Uh, so it's like, also, who are researchers and do they have to have an institutional affiliation to be considered researchers? What is research is another question here in the big science approach. Uh, I, 
credit to the, the people who really did the organizing here, the, the approach to inviting researchers uh, to work on Bloom was anybody can be a researcher, and like that's the Irene take, like absolutely anybody, but it's a question of like how do you get the infrastructure and the access. We haven't, I think a part of the reason the conversation's been so binary is if you look at the trends, there's not as many, a binary versus open versus closed um, for replication. I think that the approach that Meta started to take with Llama uh, and gating it's such a bummer that it wasn't respected, and we see this as well with stable diffusion and the attempt for a staged release. We don't have a ton of data on successful alternative release approaches outside of the binary, but maybe there can be better, uh, there, there can be better lessons learned from working more intentionally with communities, providing not just access, but also infrastructure to do the kind of research that needs to happen, uh, and also provide more safe methods for increasing access. Yeah, um, so I guess a follow up on this. Um, so my question is really like, Llama isn't open, right? The weights are open, but there is no data open. We don't know what is being used yep. to train Llama, and we don't know what data washing or what yep. data wrangling was done. Um, and so, you know, in the grand scheme of things, is Llama even, would you consider it like an open? Yeah, I would consider it a downloadable gated. Uh, so you can probably like run it if you have the infrastructure to do that, but it is, it is a gated system and then people did stuff and made it less gated. Uh, but this is, hopefully this, this kind of framework can help you think about that. Thank you. <laughs> time for the session, but uh, whoever feel free to stay, like, please stay and ask away. But yeah, and I need to thank our uh, presenters here today. So. Hi, um, I have a question for Vinita on um, the work on disability bias. Um, really good work. I just wanted to know, like, what are the details in, um, like, you had, like, a focus group. so. There was a lot of details, like, because pe persons with dis disabilities are very sensitive population. So what was the thought that went through while selecting or forming your focus group? And like, what were your criteria while doing so? Yeah, thanks for your question. So we recruited um, basically anyone who identified as having a disability because we wanted to include a really broad and diverse range of people in this kind of preliminary work and understanding how people are reacting to content about disability. Um, our focus groups were three people, and then me as a moderator or another person on our team as the moderator, and we chose that size so that we give people ample time to you know, connect with other people in the group, but also share their individual perspectives. We want to avoid group think and having people kind of converge on the same opinions and really give um, a lot of value to diversity of thought. Uh, and then we try, we recruited through a third party vendor for our focus groups and so um, the criteria we gave to them is to be um, uh, racially uh, representative of the US disability population um, and as well as age group um, representation in the US disability population and then balancing for gender as much as we can. Thank so, you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I'm Sayash, a PhD student at Princeton. First of all, thanks for the great panel. Uh, question for Irene. Um, I really appreciate the focus on like the non-technical aspects of risk mitigation. The, the one reason I think a lot of the focus is on technical is because we can ask the companies who are building these models themselves to bear the costs. So what are some ways to shift the cost of like community efforts, risk mitigations, and so on? onto the companies who are causing like, harm or releasing these models in the first place? Yeah, I mean, that saying that technical tools aren't the solution doesn't mean they're not helpful. Uh, it's especially as we're getting increasingly capable high performance models, a lot of other rants about what performance means. Uh, we're just reaching diminishing returns on a lot of technical tools like detection models. Uh, haven't seen watermarking deployed at scale, uh, but also what has proved, not necessarily proved, but what has been more helpful is to take what I call a cocktail approach of mixing these different methods uh, and, and having more, um, having, this is like 
the theme of interdisciplinary research, being able to plug in different expertise at Hugging Face, we, use, we work with our legal counsel to think about responsible AI licenses, and we work with our technical team to uh, build more spaces for accessibility uh, and having and work on research to, to have more labels and to have more evaluation. Uh, so like interdisciplinary work is the theme here. First of all, great talks, all of you. So thank you so much for the session. Um, my question is for Aylin. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but I'm sure you are, with Bullock Bassi's uh, de-biasing of gender embeddings in GloVe. Um, I was wondering if you thought a similar approach would be fruitful for the clip embeddings that you're looking at, or whether you felt that would be effective in sort of mitigating some of the things that you found. That's a great question. We haven't tried devising these models and evaluating them, but that's one approach we can try. And there has been some literature in this area showing some of the advantages as well as limitations of these approaches. So overall, we have been interested in more comprehensive approaches, especially that take into account the socio-technical perspectives given the legal and ethical concerns in this domain. There have been some, for example, attempts to prompt engineer these systems so that they don't generate content that is related to certain concepts. But again, that becomes problematic because there are indirect associations that also get uh, blocked by these systems. We do not have trivial solutions right now about what we should remove from this system without understanding what kind of side effects it's going to cause. So that is certainly a very interesting research direction. Um, I have a question from the online Hopin platform. Uh, this is by Iris. Uh, this is for you, Michael. Um, so the question is, uh, have you tested anything regarding image quality? I'm thinking about having worse images of houses if we ask about houses in a language from which its associated culture is underrepresented in the data set, even if the concept is understood. Good question. OK, so regarding quality, um, what we mostly observed was that it was a model level thing. And it's more a binary question of, is this concept possessed by the model in the given language, yes or no? So the, like, uh, I think you were mentioning the house example that I described. Yeah. Uh, I right. can read it out again. So I'm thinking about having uh, worse images, uh, images of houses, uh, uh, if you ask about houses in a language from which its associated culture is underrepresented in yes. the data set. Yes. Um, so that, I guess that point was more of a motivating hypothetical on the idea that there are going to be different cultural defaults for these different objects across the languages. But you're right, that it, it, there is an issue that if it's underrepresented in the corpus, maybe it will be lower quality in generation. But what we find is that in these models, um, it, it's using information from examples of other houses and, and other things maybe in the cultural context to inform what gets generated. So one example that I touched on very briefly when I was showing the I generated in Hebrew, uh, we observed a problem with Hebrew across many of the models where it would just generate basically landscapes of Jerusalem, no matter what the object was. And we think the reason why is because these are multilingual tokenizers that are splitting apart character by character because Hebrew words in the Hebrew alphabet, it, it's the language that has its own alphabet that's not shared by any others. So the tokenizer is probably splitting it character by character. And then there's such a small amount of images that have Hebrew captions because ostensibly these data sets are cleaned to be English only. So then the impact of that is maybe someone went on their tour of Israel for a summer and uh, took some pictures of the landscapes and then posted them online and it's mostly an English caption with just a small amount of Hebrew text. Well, if those are the only examples of Hebrew text that are available to be associated with, we observe exactly that. So it's just landscapes of Jerusalem for eye, landscape of Jerusalem for hair, landscape of Jerusalem for uh, anything else. So hopefully that kind of answers your question. Yeah, um, yeah, like this has been recorded online, so thank you for your okay. response. Okay, cool, thank you.